chance nice to do a bit of meditation at the weekend uh, uh, on last Saturday. I don't know if that was um, anybody wants to ask any questions from that because if you're not familiar or if you want to check anything you're left wondering so you're very welcome to ask although we have done that meditation before with some people those meditations Yeah, so they seem to me to be worth doing, really. Like, uh, we also we want to sort of refute everything with the logic of, uh, you know, realizing ultimate truth, emptiness, uh, refute all this arising and passing away and ceasing and all that. But uh, it's good to get an idea as good as possible of how it is, how it is like, what it is like on the conventional level. So, what, what, what? How are we supposed to think of these conditioned things? which surround us, you know, we are conditioned things ourselves. So, you know, what does it mean to be a rising, lasting, passing away? A rising, lasting destruction are our, are our characteristics. So how do we supposed to, um, you know, get a good feel of that on a conventional level, I thought before using it to go to emptiness. But then once you have that, that sense of, um, uh, how it is in the, on the conventional level, then it, it does, you know, it does lead to emptiness. Like, you know, this idea of subtle impermanence. So it leads to meditation and emptiness. It leads to, you know, having to accept that um, what we think of as a solid, you know, substantial entity like us or something like that. Uh, it's kind of, um, well, there's a series of moments there. So um, we're not quite... Uh, as we appear, even on the conventional level, before we even get to emptiness. So it's good to get a mind around that. How do these three, three things arising, lasting, ceasing, go together? Um, and, and what does it make a phenomena when all those three are supposed to be going on? Um, yeah, so... Um, So first of all, uh, subtle impermanence then, that was, um, you know, the uh, a lot of teachings in Buddha's uh, uh, approach, you know, is on gross impermanence. When, when Buddha leaves behind palace life and goes off in search of uh, some spiritual truth, it's just the fact of gross impermanence uh, that uh, is spurring him on. You know, he, he looks at old age, sickness and death. So there's like very gross types of impermanence. And so that's what, um, you know, turns him away from uh, just um, the luxuries of uh, palace life, you know, the possibilities of samsara uh, kind of, you know, uh, becomes disenchanted. And so that's just gross impermanence. But you can see how philosophers, um, you know, thinkers trying to get deeper into Buddhist teachings. Once they've got the, they started thinking about those things, then you know, subtle impermanence comes along, you have to start thinking about that as well. And then that will sort of, you know, en enhance your uh, sense of renunciation if you've got a good sense of subtle impermanence too. So then uh, from, from, from that sort of, you know, better understanding of, the, of un impermanence or, you know, condition phenomena on the um, conventional level, then you can see how that's going to lead to um, uh, sort of emptiness and there's that the selflessness and there's that selflessness of the um of the kind of uh well we said let's say gross selflessness of phenomena or i don't know whether we should call it that um but the uh the the, the way that these um low schools are are kind of you know coming at their understanding of uh conditioned phenomena is is to say that um the uh, the moments are kind of real. Yeah? The moments are um, kind of um, foundational. The mo moments are substantial somehow. And then you get this. Um, then how does the thing last through time? Well, it's it's, it's just somehow the mind is joining the moments up, and uh, you know, um, kind of positing something on top of the moments. 
So just as we are familiar with that um, process uh, in terms of spatial parts, when we're talking about, you know, uh, a thing like a bicycle and maybe, you know, in terms of, you know, where's the person uh, amongst the parts, body and mind. So not just spatial parts, but parts in terms of, you know, matter and consciousness. So also you can, you, impermanence is telling you to look at, um, break things down in terms of time too. So the, how does something persist through time? Well, it starts to come down to, you know, it's, it's the sort of, you know, participation of the mind, this sort of joining the dots up, joining the moments up to make it seem like a, a continuing phenomena when it's um, in reality, it's just a series of moments. That's a kind of uh, a sort of a, a sketch of the lower schools presentation. And from that, you can get a good meditation and emptiness, uh, but a sort of a gross emptiness. It's not the emptiness that, um, that uh, you know, guide and does is trying to push us towards, but it's, it's going there, you know, it's on the way there. So I'm going to use for that one, um, there's a quote, Um, page So this is the um, Abhidharma Kosha Basya. So that's the um, treasury. Yeah, that's Vasubandhu. So he writes this um, treasure, which is a collection of um, views of these uh, uh, Abhidharma schools, uh, traditional type of conservative type of Buddhist schools that Nagarjuna comes along and, and starts, you know, to play skittles with. So. Uh, we say basically great expositionist in terms of the verses, but then in terms of the commentary, prose commentary, which is also written by Vasubandhu, then, uh, you know, more sutra followed points are coming in. But there, you can see once you start reading it, there are very many different points of view. It's not just um, limited to those two. Those two are just like a convenient kind of a shorthand for different uh, opinions all over the place. So this is a, a, a writer called Sang, Sangabhadra. I think I'd put him more in the, the greatest positionist school than, rather than, than the Sutra followers. Um, but uh, I don't know much about him, so just let's listen to what he says. So this is, um, you know, trying to understand the conditioned phenomena, trying to present them uh, according to, you know, what they, what they understand the Buddha said, and then trying to sort of make that into a kind of, you know, a, a kind of a neat philosophy. So he says, um, the question is, what is specified by the term stream of conditioned forces? So that's your conditioned phenomena, you see. He says conditioned forces, that's with our uh, conditioned things. So, um, you know, you think of them in terms of stream, you know, so they're, they're unfolding over time with um, continual change sort of thing. So that's, that's, that's the idea you're supposed to, we're supposed to get uh, familiar with, yeah, rather than uh, the way things appear to us, many things at least, you know, just to sit there unchanging, just, just kind of lumps of, of stuff that only, only change when external phenomena, external causes come along and, and kind of hit them. It's not like that, they're, they're, they're just a stream of continuous change. So that this is um, how uh, these uh, philosophers are talking now when they get down from, you know, the gross emptiness, uh, the gross selflessness, of, the gross impermanence of death uh, and, 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 you know, um, the breakdown or something, it get, getting down to a subtler level, then they see this this um, stream of, of conditioned forces. So what does that refer to? It, 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 and the answer is, it refers to the uninterrupted flow of conditioned factors. Okay, so that's, um, you know, when you think of conditioned, uh, conditioned phenomena, you have to think of that, this uninterrupted flow of, you know, causes leading to effects. So then what factor constitutes its intrinsic nature? What's the intrinsic nature of this um, uh, stream of conditioned forces? So he says very clearly, you see, the stream is a provisional factor. So that's just the imputed thing. That, that's just like, you know, provided a, it's like a covering provided by the mind, a, a kind of way of looking at it provided by the mind. 
uh, uh, you know, because all you've got in reality are the moments. So he says there's no intrinsic nature to the, uh, to the stream. How could one, one seek intrinsic nature in it, in the stream? Rather, moments are mutually similar. They're interconnected, interconnected in a relation of cause and effect. The conditioned forces produce effects which occur in succession without termination. This is referred to as a stream of conditioned forces. So that's something like what I was trying to get to us to think about, you know, when we're talking about the cherry tree that lasts, you know, but so, so um, it's got green leaves in the spring, it's got, you know, flowers maybe, and then the summer it's got dark green, big green leaves and then fruits. The cherries come out in, in the summer quite quickly to the cherry tree. And then the autumn, the leaves are yellow and fading and the leaves of the cherry tree are very beautiful colors. And then you have um, winter with no leaves at all. So um, that's, you know, trying to get down to this. Well, if the, if the tree is changing all the time like that, where is the, where is the one that lasts? Where is the cherry tree in my garden? Where is the cherry tree, uh, you know, that's, uh, what about the one that's, that, you know, isn't the cherry tree there in the spring? Isn't it there in the summer? Isn't it there in the autumn as well? Well, yeah, so there is a, you know, you can say the cherry tree is there in the spring, it's there in the summer, it's there in the autumn. But you can see how that's what he says, a, a, a provisional factor. It's something that's, you know, that's coming as a pro provided by the mind, isn't it? That's um, kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of, um, maybe it's like a, a kind of, um, you know, it's a conventional thing that, that's, uh, you know, the mind sees the moments as similar, so it considers it to be the same object. Of course, the moments aren't completely the same. So when you look back at, you know, for one moment of the tree to the next, there's maybe may very little change. But, uh, you know, over time, you can see that there is indeed change. And, uh, you know, so it's, um, it's sort of, a, you know, the participation of the mind is a conventional um, kind of object, we might say. So that's uh, just, um, trying to get down to that level of, um, uh, you know, the, um, before we get down to emptiness. But then you can see how, you know, that does become a kind of meditation on emptiness. The, 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 uh, the lower schools don't talk about the selfness as a phenomenon particularly. You know, that's something that the, 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 the Mahayana schools sort of insist on. But it's a, it, it's a way of thinking about things, which is very, um, you know, freeing you up from the from the attachment and the and the kind of you know grasping of these things and and seeing them in a in more clearly in a, in a, a sort of a truer light so then they say things like you know um you know my my cup or something i don't know my pen you know my pen or or or, or, or me you know or, or, or a cup you know something like you take your cup from the kettle, you know, you fill your cup with the hot water at the kettle, you make your tea, and you take it over to your table. So it was as if this, this cup is moving, you know, from, um, from, the, from the kettle to the table. So the cup is, is moving through space like that in time. But, but the way they're saying we should look at it is there's no cup that, that uh, is actually moving at all. There's one cup that arises in position A, then that, that um, vanishes and then uh, it's followed by another moment of cup arising in a different position through the, through the, you know, the force of cause and effect. The next moment arises in a different position and the next moment arises in a different position. The next moment arises in a different position. The next moment arises in a different position. So there's no cup moving across like from one side of the kitchen to the other. It's just separate cups arising in different places. <laughs> We're just seeing them, seeing it to be one cup that's moving. But that's um, that's uh, uh, kind of you know that's uh, uh, sort of mistaken, really. Like you know, on those you go on a bus or something, a modern bus or a modern you know tube station, and they have those they have those moving signs, don't they? Like you know, the next stop on the metro is you know um, Gare du Nord or something in Paris, you know. And then the next stop is Gare de l'Est or something like that. So you have this, you have these. Um, signs made up of dots don't they like um and, and they kind of move across from right to left or yeah i guess it's right to left 
So it looks like the, the, the letters are really moving across, doesn't it? And you can watch oh, the garden, oh, that's my stop, that's the next stop, you know, garden, oh, something like that. <laughs> but it's not, it's like the, the, the letter at one point is just going out, the, the lights at one point go out and the next set of lights come on. And they go out and then another set of lights come on and they go out, another set of lights come on and they go out, another set of lights come out and go out. So the idea there's a letter moving is quite false actually. It's one letter here, then one letter there, then one letter there, then one letter there, then one letter there. But we just join them all up and say, uh, you know, there's one letter moving across along the screen. <laughs> so all the phenomena are like that, apparently. Yeah, so um, this is um, a sort of, you know, going to loosen our minds up a bit, you know, before we can get rid of thinking about these, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the ultimate nature of these things. Yeah, so um, uh, there's another quote coming up from the from the text, maybe, but uh, we'll we'll uh, leave that for now. But it's a good, yeah. If you haven't seen that, um, that's the uh, latest translation of the uh, Masabandhu's Treasury. Uh, it's translated by this German scholar, Lodra Sangpo. He's kind of thinking he's in that monastery in in, in Nova Scotia somewhere with Chimpanzee children, Kagyu types, you know, maybe originally students of uh, whoever it was, Chogyam Trumper maybe, his, his organization. Uh, there is an earlier translation by Pruden, which is also very good because the, the, you know, he's got a good lot of um, explanations just from the, the translator, the original translator, De La Valle Poussin, who was a great Belgian scholar who translated it in the first place into a European language. But this, this uh, um, Lodra Sangpa has got so many more notes and you'll be, you'll be amazed at all the different views of of impermanence and conditioned phenomena that come out when you when you sort of sort of um, look at what he's what he's uh, researched. So a really good piece of work that. Yeah. So uh, let's go back to the Buddha Palata then. Uh, he's got a slightly different agenda. So we were we talking about um, verse number two, um, and we're talking about the three characteristics. Uh, of conditional phenomena arising, lasting, and destruction at this point, it says, um, they can't act, um, they can't be together on the form phenomena, and they can't act singly, they can't be singly there, and they can't be together there. You know, he's, uh, that's the Nagarjuna's verse, Nagarjuna just leaves it at that. Um, so uh, this is, um, Uh, left to Buddha Palata and us to puzzle out, you know, what's uh, what would be the fault in, in each of those uh, two possibilities. The, the three arising, the three acting one by one, uh, or three acting, you know, uh, singly to characterize the phenomena, and the thing, the, the three are uh, sort of somehow acting in a combined way to, uh, uh, you know, um, characterize the phenomena. So this isn't so much a, a verse which is, um, picking on specific, you know, specialized wrong views of uh, these traditional uh, lower schools. Um, we, we've um, met with that hint of that, you know, where uh, uh, in the last verse, and it's going to come back very quickly in the verse after this one. But this one is more like um, a general, uh, uh, a general qualm, you know, if you're saying things are inherently existent, you know, general in that sense, general attack on uh, the problem of if you say these three characteristics are inherently existent. So nothing specialized about some, some particular uh, kind of, you know, um, unusual view of any lower school. It's just a general fault of if you try to cling to these things as being inherently existent. So um, just look at verse number two. I'm just having to leave you for a moment.
So we've had uh, a little look at um, the first uh, couple of paragraphs of this uh, section where we're talking about um, mainly about arising, the first of the three characteristics. And, um, you know, he's saying, how can you have arising, you know, so we've discussed that. I'm not going to go back into it, but this problem of, um, you know, when the arising is happening, the pot isn't supposed to be there. Because, but, but if the pot's not there, how can it be arising? You know, if it's uh, what's doing the arising, if pot's not there, then, you know, isn't that something that's supposed to be doing the arising? And the question of if you grasp it inherent existence, that, that, um, that really becomes a bit of a problem. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's going to come back um, more than once. So that's um, um, definitely uh, something we'll have to come back to. So I won't say anything more now. So now we'll go on to lasting. So lasting, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the opponent, you see, he, 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 without really getting to the bottom of um, totally about this arising business, he says the, the, the opponent or the person who's defending the, uh, these other schools' views, he says, uh, oh, well, lasting, lasting at any rate exists. So we're leaving aside arising then, what about lasting? So, um, uh, uh, um, the response from uh, um, uh, Buddha Padre is, you know, lasting is untenable also. So I think we should maybe men mentally think lasting um, singly on its own is untenable. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading from, um, you know, the second half of page four, right? So I think I think we should think maybe lasting singly on its own is is untenable. But you know, uh, whether you're thinking of it on its own or you know, in in, in accompanied by any other uh, of the of the three factors, I think the answer is still the same, uh, on its own or accompanied by other factors then it's still going to be a problem if you just assume inherent existence. But uh, Buddha Balaji is saying lasting is untenable also because it's also because it is accompanied by destruction. In this way, the conditioned are always in accompanied by impermanence. So if they're always impermanent, how can they last when the two, lasting and destruction, are contradictory? So I, I think I've said for us, I don't think lasting and ceasing are contradictory. I mean, if, if we're allowed to say that they exist, you know, like um, Buddha Pallet is quite strong on the denial side, yeah. Uh, Buddha Pallet and Nagarja in, in this text, they're, they're very much um, just um, emphasizing the, um, you know, the, the absence of these factors, just like in heart surgery, you know, there's no form, there's no feeling, there's no discrimination. Uh, there's no comes in fact, there's no consciousness. So they're, they're um, you know, how to deny the kind of um, uh, factors that the uh, um, lower schools assume. And the best, they're just allowing these, um, you know, um, conventional types of, you know, or, or imputed types of arising and, and lasting to exist. So Carver's a bit more, you know, a bit more um, keen to um, established valid cognizers for the for the conventional side. So even if it's merely imputed arising or merely merely um, you know um, merely sort of you know posited uh, ceasing, even if, even if it's merely ceasing in the perspective of mind, then there's still you can still say there's a valid cognizer kind of uh, appreciating apprehending that kind of you know arising or lasting or ceasing. But that's on carpet. So he's he's giving a little bit more of a tweak to the conventional side. But, uh, you know, if we're on the conventional side, then I, you know, following Tsongkhapa, I'm saying there is a kind of, there is a sort of a way of talking about things ceasing. There is a, is a way of talking about them lasting, but uh, not in the way that the uh, uh, lower schools uh, kind of, you know, want to have it. Uh, you know, where everything's got to have its own intrinsic nature, sort of, you know, its inherent nature, sort of guaranteeing its, uh, its, its, its sort of reality. But if you say that, you know, then, then, then things do have their own um, way of being from their own side and everything must be like that. Everything can't just be like as it's, um, you know, sort of constructed by the mind and, and, and you know, take that to be, you know, what's, what's uh, on the surface level, the things that we deal with every day, 
are they just you know sort of put there by the mind entirely without anything from the object's own side to justify them then um you know that's where the lower schools say hey that's going too far you know okay you can have an imputed continuum but your moments have got to be real you've got to impute your continuum onto real moments right so the moments arising, lasting, passing away, arising, passing away, arising, passing away, rapid succession. They are, you know, that's that's reality. That's that's the, the thing arising from cause and the conditions. And then passing away and arising and passing away, arising and passing away. So that's really happening. Then you go and impute a kind of, you know, a continuum of there's a tree that's lasted for a year over here, the tree that's lasted for a hundred years. You know, you're sort of imputing a kind of, you know, a sort of um uh, the longer lasting sort of series or continuum to be you know sort of an actual thing but still you know the moments have got to, the, the moments have got to be kind of have have reality sort of thing somewhere or other you've got to come back down to some some foundation yeah but if you don't have that then um uh, well you know anything goes so then you just end up as uh, as being unable to describe reality at all you just uh, can even know just know better than nihilists But so, but Nagarjuna's answer to that is, yeah. But okay, so let's say all these things, everything in 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 the world, then has some sort of inherent existence. But then, what do we find? Well, you can't put have lasting and ceasing going on at the same time. Yeah, and you've kind of got to because things are like that, aren't they? They do last, and they are um, ceasing as well. They are impermanent. They're always, you know, kind of going somewhere you know, they're always changing from what look from what they were before aren't they the impermanence might be very subtle very difficult to see but always the next moment is slightly different from the one before and in many cases that's very obvious you know in some you know your your your, your food is going rotten or your, your flowers are opening in the spring whatever it is you know many things it's good it's completely you know clear that in the momentary sense yeah they're there momentary but every moment is different from the next and so there is this impermanence as well. So you've got to be able to present lasting and impermanence, you know, um, on the same base, haven't you? But that's what you can't do. If things, if something inherently lasts, how can it be uh, passing away? And if it's inherently passing away, how can it be lasting? So that's the, um, that's the, the, the kind of, um, that's the sort of, you know, the, um, that's the position you know, of Buddha Palatira. You know, that, you know, you, you, it, it, once you've got inherently existent, they can't both come together, and he won't let you, uh, he won't abandon that position. So here we assume that Buddha Palatira is talking about inherent lasting, inherent impermanence, right? So that becomes clear, or that becomes, you know, forcefully stated by Arya Deva below. But uh, before he quotes Arya Deva, uh, Buddha Palata is quoting uh, another verse from uh, uh, the same chapter, verse 23, uh, quite a powerful verse. So um, this is, you know, aimed at those uh, lower schools who want to have uh, inherent existence for everything. Then he says, that there is lasting for a thing, that ceasing is untenable. Whatever isn't ceasing, though, it being the things untenable. Yeah. So it's like everything ceasing. That's one of the, you know, sort of very, you know, um, kind of key features uh, of, um, of all the uh, hmm, conditioned phenomena we see around us. We see them all passing away. We see them all sooner or later, you know, um, becoming, uh, you know, becoming different from what they were before. And in the, you know, that often means that they, 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 something that was like, you know, beautiful or something that was complex, something that was constructed, something sophisticated, you know, crumbles away and becomes, you know, something useless or something, you know, damaged or something broken or something dead, you know. Uh, but anyway, even if, even if the thing is apparently growing, something's apparently becoming more beautiful, something's currently, apparently being, being constructed again, you know, that, that in the end it has to be sort of uh, destroyed and pass away, you know, however, uh, kind of, you know, solidly it's made it eventually, you know, even the mountains get ground down into mud and are washed 
you know, like a wash to the sea, even, even huge great mountains. So um, everything's ceasing then. So then there's no lasting for something that's ceasing. So that's his, um, that's his position. Yeah. Lasting, if it's inherent lasting, has to be, you know, it's, it, 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 um, it maintains itself. It doesn't wither away. It doesn't get eroded away. It doesn't get worn away. It lasts. No, it's lasting by its own power, right? So how would anything make it become more feeble or, or kind of, you know, changed or, or kind of, uh, you know, worn or, or kind of um, uh, sort of, you know, aged? Because it's lasting by its own power. So that's, that's, a, that's a good verse, really. Whatever isn't ceasing, though, it being a thing is untenable, you know. So to be a thing, it is, it is, that's a very characteristic, you know, very, very much a samsaric, you know, recognition, you know, that all things, you know, just going towards a cessation. On the Buddha ground, I don't know, I don't know, it, it, on the Buddha ground where everything's, you know, free from the contaminations of affliction and, and, and contaminated karma, that might be different, but, you know, on the world we're talking about at this level here, so let Mary, uh, Master Aryadeva have his, um, uh, his, his uh, uh, statement then. He's very forceful. He's very like, uncompromising. His verses are kind of very sort of, you know, stiff sometimes. He's supposed to be a direct disciple of um, Tsongkhapa. Sorry, I've not got you now. Um, that's... Uh, yeah, I don't think there's not any reason to deny that, as far as I know. So he's um, very close to the great master. So, you know, a bit before Buddha Palita, but a classic, you know, in the classic, um, you know, Mahayana, sorry, uh, Madhyamaka lineage. A thing that does not last, what's that? Impermanent, how lasting then? Suppose it lasted at the start, it never would grow old at last. If always there's impermanence, then lasting there will never be. Or what was permanent before will later be impermanent. If something were at one same time, both lasting and impermanent, that thing's impermanence would fail, or else its lasting would be false. Yeah, so um, you have to, uh, you know, sort of get hold of the, the idea, yes, he's talking about things, you know, inherently doing all this. So that's the problem. So a functioning thing must last. I mean, he says a thing that does not last, what's that? So he's saying that, you know, a thing has got to last. You know, even if it's the last moment of Badalambo, you know, the last moment of, of um, you know, the consciousness of, of a sentient being before they become uh, a, a foe destroyer or, you know, something that actually goes into without any, um, you know, really, really the last moment, like the last moment of a soap bubble before it pops. Yeah. So even if you're saying that's the very last moment, there's still it's still going to be a, there's still going to be a tiny uh, time involved, isn't that? You know, it arises, then it comes into existence. It cannot go out of existence until it has come into existence. Yeah? So it can't cease until it's until it's in existence. So that even in a tiny moment, you've got you've got to have some uh, you know some time when it is is going from existent to non-existent, or some time from you know it's going to be some some tiny sort of a, no, instant, really, surely. Uh, but, uh, you know, think about that. But if it inherently lasted, you know, how would it, how would sort of uh, impermanence kind of eat away at it? How would impermanence consume it? If it's inherently lasting, it's not vulnerable to, um, you know, it's not vulnerable to attack. It's not vulnerable to degradation. It lasts inherently. So why should it even change? And, and, and stay the same, like the cherry tree in, in, in the park, you know, it, it changes, but somehow it stays to be the cherry tree, you know, throughout the changes of the seasons or the changes of the hours of the day, you know, it's still the cherry tree, but, but if, it, if it's inherently lasting, why would, it, why would it even change even a tiny bit? Yeah, the, 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 the forces, you know, no forces impact on it, inherently lasts by way of its own power. So if it has, if it is what it is, then with the characteristic of inherent lasting, then uh, it's sort of invulnerable, surely. Uh, and then, you know, um, 
if from the beginning it inherently lasts, then it would never grow old, it would never cease. So that's the first verse. And then the next verse, which is number 23, I think, is, yeah. Um, so here we're now saying, okay, well, if conditioned things are impermanent, you, of course, we have to accept the conditioned things are impermanent, we should accept that. So then um, there can't be any inherent lasting for them then. If they're impermanent, you know, they've got to be, you know, they've got to be degrading, they've got to be going down, they've got to be going out of existence. They've got to be arriving at non-existence. So then there's no lasting. Yeah. So um, lasting means maintaining its similar type, maintaining itself, maintaining itself, maintaining itself, going on, and all this inherent lasting. But if it's um, if there's impermanence, there's exactly the opposite happening. So you can see how they think that lasting, this inherent lasting, means permanence. It can't change at all. Yeah. So then, if you say, well, it starts off inherent lasting and then becomes um, impermanent later, then it, it it starts off lasting and then becomes impermanent a bit further down the line. Well, it's starting off being permanent and then later becoming impermanent, which is, you know, um, nobody says wants to accept that particularly. Yeah. Can we have something that's permanent, that later on becomes impermanent? Have you ever thought about that? You know, we, uh, we make two categories when we're studying Buddhist philosophy very early on, um, you know, right early on in our studies, we say, oh, there's two types of objects of knowledge, two types of existing things, you know, existing phenomena. One is the permanent ones and one is the impermanent ones. But why shouldn't there be something that's permanent and then becomes impermanent later? That sounds all right, doesn't it, Hanali? Are you there, Hanali? Or eating your supper? Can't see you. She's gone off somewhere. I'm here. Hey, Jason. Jason. Hanley's back now. Yeah, I'm back. Oh, I was here all along. Jimpa's <laughs> here as well. Jimpa, huh? I wondered why you weren't in the room. Yeah. So. Does that sound okay to you then? There could be something that's permanent and then becomes impermanent later, later on in its life. Well, it doesn't sound good, no. Well, you've got your pot, you see, that's, that's been made and you put it on the shelf in the, in the warehouse and nobody touches it. Yeah, and it's a nice warehouse where it's like a wine cellar. It doesn't get hot, it doesn't get cold in the, in the summer or the winter. It's just a very stable temperature. Um, uh, like these French wine cellars, you know, so it's, it, it's um, nothing much is happening, you see, and that the, the pot is in its uh, box, so it's not being um, exposed to any light or anything like that. It's just packaged away, waiting in the warehouse, but nobody's buying these pots, so it just stays in the pot and in, in, in the warehouse for months. And then it's, it's in a position of not changing then, isn't it? Mm, no. <laughs> Well, there's nothing happening to it. Nothing's making it change. So why should it change? There's no external, you know, um, sort of, uh, yeah, stimulus or no internal, no external impact or anything. It just changes. Well, it's it's nature to change. It can't change. It's it's nature. You've been com convinced of that, have you? No. <laughs> Yeah, some, some outsiders will say that they say the nature of things is basically permanent and then it's only impermanent when when uh, things come along and, and, and hit it or, you know, or, or affect it. Yeah, well, you can't change the basic nature of a phenomenon, can you? Well, um, that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, is, is it... Um, is that basic to its nature then? You know, like, um, if, it's, if it's permanent at the beginning, 
does it have to go on being permanent until it ceases to exist? Yes. Yes, well, yes, it's like um, if you think about permanent, you see, if it's unchanging by its nature, then how could it change? But who says it's unchanging by its nature? It's only there, it's only just dormant, yeah? So the change in, when change affects it, then it will change. But yeah, if, if, if it's permanent, how could it ever change? It's, it's, a, it's really a um, good question to ask yourself. And then difficult to think about, but in order to stop being permanent, in order to, you know, it would have to change, wouldn't it? In order to go from a state of being unchanging to a state that's changing, then it would have to change. So you'd have an unchanging thing changing. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't have the nature of being unchanging. Yes, I don't know. So, um, so the, 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 the um, philosophers come down on the Buddhist side and they say, well, everything's got to be changing all the time. It can only change at one moment if it's, if it's, if it's you know, in the conditional, in the continual stream of change. And it's actually changing all the time, even though, you know, for periods of time, the change may be subtle so that you can't, um, you know, easily see it. But still, you know, that flow of change has to be going on. So that otherwise, you know, it could never change at all. Once it gets into a state of being permanent, it couldn't change. I mean, it could go out of existence. But the very fact, the fact of going from, from unchanging to changing is like, you know, um, it seems impossible somehow. Yeah, so um, that's what um, Arya Davis putting across anyway. So what, were per what was permanent before would later be impermanent. He sees that as an absurd position. He sees that as impossible. It can't be permanent and then become impermanent. So then you know, the Buddhists say, yeah, well, then, yes, everything is changing all the time. And that's just how we try to meditate on Saturday. But uh, how you get to, to convince yourself of that. Uh, you know, everything that we ended up saying or claiming, you know, that, you know, anything that arises immediately has to pass away. So why is that, Jimpa? Uh, Do you remember, it's... were you there on Saturday? Uh, yes, I was there, Gisela. You hear me? Yes, I can. Thank okay. you. Yes, very well. Uh, so yes. why? Go on. Uh, because it is produced. Yes. So what's your, what's your kind of extra explanation for that? You know, if somebody says everything that is, uh, is produced from causes immediately has to and go out of existence. Yeah, because the, the, the causes and the conditions themselves, themselves ha have to change moment by moment. So the effect has to change itself. As the causes change, the effect must change. So why do the causes change all the time? Because there are effects of previous causes. <laughs> what did we say about the butter lamp? Yeah, you. Do you remember what we said about the butter lamp? Why does it go out at the last moment? Yes, I do. The, the fuel is, uh, is being consume, consumed. So that, like the, the causes are seizing for the effect to arise. So you, you consume the butter. That's why the fire is arising, the flame is arising. And each moment of flame needs its own moment of fuel, otherwise it cannot come into existence. Yeah, that's, um, that seems to be powerful to me, that, um, you know, the, um, as soon as the, the causes, the, the effect arises, the causes have disintegrated, because the cause have to give way, have to give up their own nature in order for the effect to arise. At least they're talking about the substantial cause, and therefore, you know, um, the, the, the effect can only arise out of the disintegration of the cause. But if we, like we tell, like we know very well about um, machines or, 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 or lamps uh, that, that rely on, on liquid fuel like butter, you know, if there's no more fuel and there's no more flame. So as soon as the, the, the causes have disintegrated, 
you know, no more fuel, and there's no more flame, so the flame has to go out. As soon as its causes have, have, have disintegrated, it goes out. Yeah, so that's, um, that's, you know, getting down to this momentary nature of, th of things. So that's, um, but are all things like that, you see? It's hard to sort of agree with that immediately. So some things appear to just go on, uh, just existing, looking like the same as they were in the moment before. But that's a false appearance, because everything, when you think about it, has to be like that last moment of the bottle lamp. So there's never going to be anything permanent that can become impermanent. The permanent things are just, um, you know, quite a different kettle of fish. There's no, no, no sort of entity like, um, you know, consciousness or matter or anything to be changing. They're much more likely to be abstract phenomena or um, negative phenomena without any kind of, you know, kind of, you know, sort of um, qualities of their own, sort of that, uh, you know, they're just um, uh, nothing like, like a functioning thing, you know. Anyway, okay, let's, uh, then, and the next verse. Um, if something were at one same time, both lasting and impermanent, yeah? So if it's lasting, it can't be impermanent. If it's impermanent, it can't be lasting. But if it were both at the same, at the same time, um, well, that's impossible. Um, either the thing cannot be impermanent, or it cannot be lasting. You can't have both. If once you're going to sort of inherently existent qualities, those two qualities are opposed to each other. But that doesn't affect us. We can say on the conventional level that pot's doing both. Pot is lasting and it is also ceasing. I'm lasting and I'm ceasing. But am I lasting by way of my own very nature? Well, it, 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 you know, if you just talk about these moments, one moment follows another, one moment follows another. So a, mo a moment arises out of the ruins of the, of the moment before. And then, you know, the mind is smoothing that over and say, yes, so there is a phenomenon. There is, there is a, a a guy there was lasting, there is a low cell that was lasting. But that's your, your mind is just prepared to see those, those, that series of moments as a kind of, you know, a continuity. So the lasting is coming from your side of your mind, isn't it really? So you have to think about these things. It's, um, it's hard to get that view of yourself, to break down the sense of your, you know, you're kind of, you know, just here all the time. It's just, it's me in the same moment, one moment after another, it's just me, right, you know. The idea that you're, you're arising differently in every moment is, is kind of, you know, quite, a, um, quite an intriguing thought. And if you can get down to experience yourself like that, <clears throat> how did you experience yourself? What was it? The impression. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Goenka, yeah. Goenka, you have to go do a Goenka course to, <laughs> to experience yourself as being totally impermanent. That's Yoris. Yoris says that. Now find all this reasoning, just do a Goenka course and you can get it. You get a real taste of it, man. Just a direct experience. Okay, well, um, uh, that's uh, lasting then. So, destruction. So okay, the um, the uh, the opponent says, "Oh well, destruction exists." So as I said, with, I have this difficulty about destruction. Sometimes Buddha Palata seems to be saying, you know, the destruction, the final end of something, you know, the final complete, like the death of a person, you know, destruction. Or well, sometimes he's talking about ceasing, just like um, uh, uh, Arya Devi used the word ceasing, like it's 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 proceeding towards destruction. It's becoming destroyed. Um, so, um, you know, I just, it's odd that there should be these two different possibilities and there's not a kind of more clear distinction between them. Tsongkhapa recognizes both of them, you know, these two possibilities and, and mentions them both. So he's, he's aware of them, but I'm not going to read, I haven't got his quotation right now. Anyway, just bearing in mind the possible different, two different meanings of destruction. 
In the absence of lasting, how will there be destruction? For if the lasting of a thing exists, it will be destroyed. But if there is no lasting, how will it be destroyed? Well, okay, you know, even a, even a very short moment of something, it's got to last for that tiny bit of time. And you know, there's something existing, as soon as it's existing, it is lasting. And so then, then it can be destroyed. But if there's no lasting, then there's nothing to be destroyed. As we have already explained, destruction means annihilation and non-existence. Okay, that means like, he's talking about destruction, there's like death there. So, you know, to, be die, to die, you've got to be alive, at least for a moment. So, you know, we've got to last for at least a tiny little uh, moment of time, at least. And then you put the moments together, then, yeah, you've got a continuum of stream, which then gets cut off. You know, a stream of, of moments of similar type, and then a stream of moments of similar type finish, and you become something radically different takes its place. Like you've got the nice whole pot which holds water, it gets smashed. So then that's destruction, when something radically different, something no longer able to hold water, comes into existence. So yeah, what, what it exists upon, what destruction exists upon, does not exist at all. So he's talking about destruction, that final end of destruction now. So like a dead person isn't a person, right? So a destroyed pot is not a pot, it's something like that. Okay, well, we can all accept that. Therefore, destruction is also not tenable as a characteristic of the conditioned. Yes, but, um, you know, we had this idea of, you know, what about something ceasing as it goes along? Being coming destroyed, you know? What's wrong? Why, why aren't you talking about that? So that's not particularly clear to me. Anyway, thus, in that way, arising, lasting and destruction taken singly are not tenable as characteristics of the condition that had been brought about. So they each require the other, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, the, the, um, there's got to be, you know, more than one of them happening. And in any, in any uh, process or, or, or any event, like, 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 like the, the coming to existence of a pot and the going out of existence of a pot, then, you know, just for a pot to be and then to, to cease to be, all three are needed, it seems. And then uh, Bhagapalaji says, because it is said that they arise simultaneously, those who know the state of the Dharma say that arising, lasting and destruction arise simultaneously. So for that reason, they, also, they are also not tenable as characteristics singly. So that's kind of, you know, um, what you often find in these textual reasoning, but then you also have a scriptural quotation to back up your um, view. So you, you find a quotation from the Buddha's teaching that, um, sort of, um, uh, it, you know, sort of um, justifies your view. So he's saying that now these, these three have to be there all together in combination because, you know, that's how the Buddha explained it. So Buddha's being the most reasonable person, he's going to explain this in the most reasonable way. So um, if you're going to disagree with the Buddha, you've got to have very good, uh, you know, some very good arguments. But as we said, you know, like uh, if you say pot arises, lasts, and passes away simultaneously, does all those three simultaneously. That doesn't really make sense, does it? So I don't think you're going to have a, you know, something arising and being destroyed at the same time. It can only be destroyed after it's come into existence. So I don't know if we've got a quote about that here somewhere. Mr. Graham. So this is, um, you know, how we've been talking about it, but it's just to give a, a quotation. This is from the Mahave Bahasa. So this is the, uh, the great exposition text that uh, those uh, great expositionists, or otherwise known as the Vibhaskas, um, that's the text they rely on. So, you know, different solutions are, are, are come up with, you know, okay, so these, these all factors have to be there on a, uh, on a single 
um, factor, a single condition factor simultaneously. So how do you explain that? So, well, yeah, you have to, um, um, you know, well, you can't have a, a rising and destruction at the same time. So what you're going to do? So as a second solution, the Maha Vibhasa suggests that the states of production and destruction as pertaining to one factor do not constitute a single moment. And yet every moment contains all of the conditioned characteristics. So you have one factor like pot, you can't have it, you know, being produced and being destroyed at the same time. So how do we fit it all together? That is to say then, how do they say? So birth functions in the future time period when the factor is about to be produced. So arising, you know, that's birth. I think it means arising, coming to birth. Um, that's before, um, that's when pot is still in the future. Pot's arising, so pot hasn't arisen yet. It's still in the future. There's arising. And the remaining conditioned characteristics function in the present time period when the factor is about to be destroyed. So, you know, lasting and ceasing, and, and if you like aging, uh, impermanence, they're all, you know, happening as the, as, the, as, the, uh, as the factor goes towards destruction. So here the Mahavabhasa summarizes a position that would appear to suggest that each moment contains three characteristics, continuance, senescence and desinescence. So <laughs> thing that is lasting, aging, and becoming destroyed, ceasing, on one factor together with the birth of the subsequent factor. So what he means is what she means it is, I think. Um, okay, so we've got the first moment of the pot. So that's lasting, that's aging, and that's ceasing. But at the same time, there is a rising. It's not a rising of the first moment of pot, but it's a rising of the second moment of pot. So that's how you can have all the, all the factors together at one time. And they're all on one object in the sense they're on, on pot, but you have to be careful. It's the first moment of pot is doing the lasting, the ceasing, and the, and the kind of the aging. And it's the second moment of pot, which is coming up at that time, is arising at the time of the first moment of pot. So, it's the second moment of what that's doing the arising. In this way, the production and destruction of a single factor would not be simultaneous. But you can have the three, the three actions going on simultaneously. So that's how it's got to be, I think, you know. So which of those three factors you pick on, that's up to you. Like we said before, you know. Um, you know, are you going to see the what you see over on the other side of the valley? Are, are you going to see many trees there? Or are you going to see one forest? Well, that was on Sunday, wasn't it? We were talking about that Sunday evening. Yeah. Anyway, yes, you can see what I mean. Like, are you going to see many trees over there? Or you, you, get, a, you get a piece of bread, you know, uh, uh, from the supermarket, you know, it's already sliced. So you take the, the plastic wrapping off. I say, well, what are you looking at? Are you looking at one loaf? Or are you looking at many slices? So somebody goes, say, well, that's a loaf of bread over there. Another person would say, oh, look, many slices of bread. So that's the same with this arising, cease, elastic, and ceasing. Yeah? Somebody's saying, oh, that's, that's a, a bean seed that's ceasing. Somebody says, no, no, that's the bean sprout arising. And somebody says, no, no, that's, that's the bean organism, the, you know, the bean plant, the, bleed, the bean organism just lasting. And they're all right, yeah. So it's, uh, um, do they all have their own different natures? Have you ever, have you ever grown any beans, uh, any bean spouse, Francois? Oh, he's just switched his, his camera off. I just wanted to sneeze. Okay. Uh, so Sorry, were you leaving the, <laughs> leaving the talk? No, no. <laughs> What, what did you say, Geshe? Have you ever done? Have you ever, have you ever done bean sprouts? Made bean sprouts in your kitchen? Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So you've got um, you've got you know the bean sprouts are rising, the bean seed is ceasing, but something you can say is lasting. You know, you can say that the bean organism, the bean, whatever it is, the bean plant or something, it's lasting, right? Well, those three, are they the same nature or different nature? 
three actions. All happening at the same time, right? Yeah. On the same dish, you know, with the wet cloth and the, the warm, warm uh, place in your kitchen. Same nature or different nature? Different nature. Different nature. Yeah, the, 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 the bean sprout is arising. So that's the main thing we're interested in. Most people will see that. But you know, you can say the bean seed is ceasing. Because the bean seed is losing its strength and it's losing its shape, you know, it's losing its, its hardness and just softening up and becoming, losing its, you know, whatever good, uh, all this goodness is going into the sprout. But then, you know, the bean, the bean thing, the bean organism, I don't know what you call it, that's still continuing. No, the bean's not dying. The bean's not becoming dead or anything. The bean plant is, so it's lasting. Though you see those as three different nature, those are those three. Um, so that means that uh, to the direct perceiver to which those three both appear, which could be your eye consciousness, they do appear differently then. Mm. Yeah, no. What do you think, Tim? To your eye consciousness, does the ceasing of the bean seed and the, the sprouting of the bean sprout and the lasting of the bean thing do they appear differently to your eye consciousness? Direct perception? No, the, the, um, they don't. I mean, it's a continual process and uh, not, they are happening at, at the, the same time. So it's difficult. You, you can't break it down into, into separate moments. It's all a, it's a continuum. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's all the same moment, really. You know, the, we, we're talking about the same period of time. The, all those three actions are going on all at once, simultaneously. Yeah. So, I mean, do they look different to the eye consciousness? Um, well, I suppose the eye, you, you'll see the, the bean will, will, will shrivel you and the, the sprout will, be, will occur somewhere else It'll um, as it grows. So you'll see different parts of the bean, one part shrivel, one part grow. So in that, in, in that sense, it's, uh, you'll, see different, you'll see different things happening. Well, is it, is it, are they both, aren't they both happening in the same place? Yes, the sprout is, is coming long, you know, so it's sticking out where the bean seed never was before. And not the, in uh, quite, ex not in the exact same geographical space because the physical location as the, as the sprout leaves where the bean, it, the sprouts forth from the bean. Yes, yes, so we, it was, it's worth thinking about it a little bit, you see. And the last thing is going on, of course. Well, but I mean, last no, the, nothing is really lasting. Everything is in constantly changing. So there's nothing to hold on to that of as lasting. That's not yeah. subtly changing moment by moment. That's right. But but lasting, we're okay. We can conventionally posit lasting. It doesn't have to be just doing it from its own side. Yeah. It's lasting within change. We're not insisting on permanent lasting where nothing changes. Yeah, yeah. It's just but we a... say, like the cherry tree in, the, in spring is not there in the summer, but the cherry tree, mm. oh, that's there in the spring and the summer and the autumn. Yeah. Well, the cherry it's just tree is lasting. The cherry that's, tree is lasting. No, it's just a label we're putting onto um, something that's constantly changing, isn't it? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's all the labels. Like, like for, I think for the eye consciousness, like you say, what's the difference to eye consciousness between ice melting and, and water arising, you know, mm. from, from ice? And they put a piece of ice out in the sun. Yeah, I mean, it's the what, same, what, what, the same thing. We're just describing it in different ways, just putting a different label on the same process. Exactly. So, you know, if the one conception, it's not related to the eye consciousness, it's all exactly the same. The, 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 the melting of the, water, of, the, of, the, of the ice and the arising of the water in that context to the icons is just exactly the same. Yeah, I agree with that, yeah. yeah. So, an H2O is lasting, H2O, it's all H2O, right? Yeah. The H2O hasn't, well, if something evaporates into the air, then, okay, then it disappears, but it's just concentrating on the, on the freezing, the, the solid becoming the liquid. Yeah. So to the icons, it's just 
all the same. So the the, yeah. the, the lasting or the, the 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 ceasing or the arising of this or that that's just mere imputation. It's just the, the mere interpretation of the mind. Yeah, one one way we we, we impute uh, the ceasing of the ice, another way we label it or label it the, uh, the arising of the water. Mm, but it's the same thing that's going on, just being, yeah. uh, you know, imputed in different ways. So then when you ask what's really going on, like we did on Sunday with the, the, the meditation with the trees and the, and the forest, what's really there? Well, there's nothing really there. You know? Yeah. It's either, you know, if you want to see it as, as many, that's up to you. If you want to see it as one, it's up to you. But he says it's really the forest. And the trees are merely just like a split up by the mind. It's really the trees and the forest is just imputed and depends on the mind. You know, neither one is more real than the other. The trees aren't more real than the forest. The forest aren't more real than the trees. You know, so each arising depends upon the other. And say so there's something that's really there that doesn't depend on anything. It doesn't depend on the mind's interpretation. Well, there's nothing. So that's voidness. So here it's just the same. So that's how we've got to get to. That's the, that's the objective to see all these arising, lasting, and ceasing, and mere imputations by the mind. So you can start to see well, if, if it's, it just depends on, on the interpretation of the mind, whether what you're looking at is an action of ceasing or action of arising, that's just up to you, the observer. Mm. It's not something that's there by the side of the object. Then, then you're sort of trying to get, you're starting to get to the point where, what no guardian is getting at. Those guys are going, oh, if it's arising, it's really got to be arising because there's some substance there that's doing the arising. Oh, this substance is going to be, you know, it's got to have inherent characteristics of ceasing. But it's mm. not like that. You don't find that. No. And especially with arising, because, you know, the thing that's arising doesn't even, doesn't even exist until after the process of arising. So the only way that you can have arising is by imputation. You know, it's only like, oh, you see the person working with the clay on the wheel, you know, the woman says, you know, it's pressing on the clay and wetting it and using a fingers to make the shape of the pot. Yes. So there's no pot there. So you can say, well, the pot's arising, but that's just your imputation. Presumably there's no pot until you, you define it as a pot on the wheel. Yeah. So you're, you know from experience that that's what's happening. From mm. your, you've seen other, other, other events very similar and you've seen the result. But right at that time, you can only say the pot's arising by, it's just, you know, it's appearing like that to your mind. There's no pot really there that's doing any arising. Mm. You never find it. So arising, lasting, ceasing, they all have that potential to, you know, once you see them properly, that's kind of, you know, they're just uh, the play of the mind, really. You know, the, the interpretation of the mind is only happening in the perspective of the mind to say, well, what's really happening from the side of the object? Well, there's nothing to present. Yeah, so you have to think like that. Okay, so um, the just to finish up this uh, end of this verse, well, no, we won't get to that, but the end of this um, kind of, you know, section. So the, uh, somebody says the statements, they are characteristics in combination. So if, if they won't work singly, so let's say, well, they will work together then, for this, this um, you know, desperate uh, opponent. So we say combined how they're in one location at one time. But we've just presented that very nicely, but you know, from the person who we, well, I tried to present it, it was nicely, but I tried my best. But um, you know, the, the person who's grasping it inherent existence, it's not possible for him. Those that are singly not characteristics and combined are mutually contradictory. How can they be on one condition thing at the same time? Thus, when there is arising, lasting and destruction do not exist. When there is lasting, arising and destruction do not exist. When there is destruction, arising and lasting do not exist. Therefore, neither singly nor in combination are arising, lasting and destruction tenable as the characteristics of the conditioned. Because their characteristics are not tenable, the condition do not exist. Yeah, so if you can't present the characteristics of the conditioned, don't pretend that there are such things as conditioned phenomena. You know, without the characteristics, how will you have the object characterized? But the, um, the, uh, the opponent's getting rather annoyed. 
What is the point of such solely specious refutations? What arise, last, and destroyed are the conditioned. So he's accusing, uh, you know, um, Naga, uh, Buddha Palatra, Nagarjuna of being, you know, just um, arguing for the sake of it or being nihilist or something. But Buddha Palatra says, we do not write in order to make specious refutations. We write in order for suchness to be known. So they have a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very sincere agenda. It's not like just uh, criticizing other people's views and having nothing to put in place. And that's not the point of the Madhyamika way, just to say all views are wrong, you have to give up views, you know. It's not so simple. Emptiness is not quite like that. Anyway, the next section is a bit, um, you know, then, then we get back to this point of, you know, this bit about arising, you see. So arising is there, but what is arising? Well, the pot's arising, but where's the pot then? Show us the pot when it's arising. You can't show it. So it's a bit, bit more returning to that issue in the next uh, little argument before the end of this verse. But we'll stop there. Well, unless you've got any question, anybody got a question? Comment? Yeah, I had a question, Gishira. Yes, Francois. Uh, what would be the reputation of someone positing that permanent and impermanent are not the nature of things, but they are just like transitory characteristic? And for mind, if someone was to say that the first moment was permanent, was not produced, and later it becomes impermanent, what would be the problem for that? Um, did you give an example? Did you say mind? The mind, yeah. First moment of mind was was permanent and then it becomes impermanent. Well, if you say it's permanent, then it's that's it's got the nature of not changing. That's the that's what permanent means, isn't it? But if it's oh, permanent, it's, it's not its not nature. Monetary. If the nature, the first moment of consciousness it's not in its nature to be permanent it's just a transitory characteristic it's not its nature at the first moment well yeah but if it is it permanent at the first moment is it permanent or not at the first moment it's permanent but it's unchanging yes but just for one moment well if it's unchanging how can it change because later moment it becomes impermanent but that's a change, isn't it? To go, to, to go from unchanging to changing, that itself is a change. But you've just said this thing is unchanging in the first moment. So how can something unchanging change? Mm. That's like something that's unbreakable breaking, yeah? If it's unbreakable, it won't break. Oh, it's unbreakable for one moment, then it breaks. Well, it never was unbreakable. What about that? <laughs> Oh, it's unbreakable, but it'll, but it'll break in the next moment. Well, it's not unbreakable, <laughs> is it? That's just a salesman trick, you know, it's unbreakable. Oh, well, that means it'll last for, for a couple of weeks. And then, you know, after that, it breaks. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's old by that time. Of course, it's going to break when it's old. But until it breaks, it's unbreakable. Yeah, but for one moment, it doesn't change. Because it's just one moment. So during that one moment, it doesn't change. Only the later moment it starts to change. <laughs> so this, this um, the, what is it? The mind of the first moment, is it unchanging? Yeah, for one moment only. <laughs> <laughs> you make a good salesman then. That's, that's <laughs> the unbreakable uh, vacuum cleaner or something. The unbreakable <laughs> computer. <laughs> Oh, it's only unbreakable one minute. <laughs> it is unbreakable. No, but I think yeah. I got so so convinced. Uh, the permanent thing is that you can go out of existence. A permanent thing can go out of existence. An unchanging thing, like we say, permanent phenomena such as the emptiness, uh, the absence of a cup on my head or something, you know, or the absence of a pen on my head. I can, I can make that, that, that permanent phenomena, the absence of the pen, go away because I put a pen on my head. So um, I, they say a permanent phenomenon can go out of existence, but it can't change into something else.
Um, and becoming impermanent is that kind of change. You say, you can't do that because it, it doesn't change. You say, oh, but that's not this nature. Mm -hmm. But still, if you accept it is unchanging, and you say, oh, well, that's not his nature, but it is unchanging, then how can it change? So that's what we say. So the, the, if something to change, it has to be changing all the time, subtly, you know, and then, then, then it's capable of, of, you know, having causes impacting on it and, and changing in a gross way too. But if, it, if it's unchanging, then, um, you know, external causes can't come along and affect it. Yes, but it's, uh, I, I thought about that one, and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, 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 kind of a doubt that, that you should bring up, because it's, uh, you know, it's a legitimate doubt. Yeah. Okay, then, we'd better stop there. Nice to talk to you again. Good reception, good, good quality, so we no problems with the technical bit. Okay then, um, Thanks, next class, no Saturday classes anymore, that was only one Saturday class, so next, to, next uh, Thursday I hope to see you. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Well. Thank you, Gisela. Good night. Good night. Good night.